Welcome, everybody. This is going to be the uh, first official Google Plus office hours, and we hope to be able to uh, repeat this quite a bit. Today, we have uh, me, Peter Norvig, and Sebastian Thrun. We're here at the Google headquarters. Uh, Salman Khan is uh, just down the road at uh, Khan Academy. And uh, right now, we have uh, seven other universities uh, from all around the United States uh, dialed in. And we're going to give each of them a chance to ask a question. And then they're going to drop out, and we're going to let other people uh, hop on board. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, let's uh, introduce ourselves a little bit. And uh, Sal, why don't you uh, kick it off? Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and what you're doing, although I'm sure uh, everyone already knows. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Sal Khan of, of the Khan Academy. And uh, uh, as, as I, I think most of the people here know, um, it was most known or continues to be known for, for a bunch of videos, a lot of which I've made and we're recently expanding the faculty um, on, on math, science, uh, even a little bit on history and economics and, and other things. But our, our mission is broader. We're a not-for-profit. We're trying to uh, enable a world-class education for anyone anywhere. And uh, a large part of that now and a large part of our team now is working on the software portion, exercises, analytics, uh, feedback, game mechanics, and all the rest. And, and we're just uh, trying to kind of push the envelope of what can be done uh, online and for free. And, and we're also trying to push the envelope on what that does to actually the live classroom. Can that take a lot of the kind of the core skills off the table and liberate the, the traditional classroom to be more interactive, to allow uh, peers to teach each other, to allow students to work at their own pace, and, and, and to really uh, do more open-ended projects in, in, inside of a classroom. Great. And uh, Sebastian, why don't you say a little bit about the class we've been teaching? Yeah, so we, we started, as you all know, uh, teaching this class <clears throat> earlier this year. Fairly spontaneously decided that it's just not enough fun to be uh, just confined to Stanford walls and to where our voice carried. So we decided to offer our classroom uh, for free. And Peter and I had speculations how many students would sign up. And Peter is a cautious gentleman. He said <laughs> 1,000. And, and I said, no, no, 10,000. And no one believed me. And uh, we started, we launched it with a single email that went out on distribution lists to about 1,000 people. And within two days, we had 14,000 students sign up, and it went all the way to 160,000. What makes me really proud is this big stream of emails I get every day from all of you, um, which I can't respond to each email individually, but, but, but there's really um, people's lives whom we change with taking this class online. And uh, at this point, we have about 30,000 students really actively engaged. It's actually quite a number. And many of you are working insanely hard uh, to learn all about artificial intelligence. I'm really excited about this. Great. Uh, well, let's go uh, right ahead and uh, go out to the schools and get some questions. And uh, let's start with uh, UC Berkeley. And unmute your mic for that, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hi. Berkeley, um, first of all, um, can you hear us? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. yes. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for taking your time doing this. We really appreciate it here at UC Berkeley. Um, first off, I'd like to ask, what was your inspiration for creating Khan Academy? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you know. Oh, I just saw echo going on. Oh, <laughs> no, it, it uh, and some of y'all know this. It started somewhat happenstance. I was uh, five, six years ago. I, w I was an analyst uh, at a, an investment firm out here, actually initially in Boston and then later in the Bay Area. And uh, uh, I started tutoring cousins. And a couple of, you know, I it eventually ended up being 20 cousins. And so I, uh, I, I was looking for ways to kind of scale the operation, uh, really still as a hobby. And I started working a little bit on the software part of Khan Academy to give my cousins exercises. And really on a, on a whim, uh, really a recommendation from a friend, decided to record a few YouTube videos that might might have been helpful for my cousins. But then that kind of took a life of its own and, and it kept going. And it became clear uh, not too long into that process that uh, th these these videos uh, could reach millions of students and not just a million students now, uh, millions of students for, for a very long time. Because, you know, calculus is not changing every every four or five years, uh, contrary to what publishers would would have you believe. Uh, so, so uh, just kept going, and then uh, and 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 when we incorporated as a not for profit, I wrote down in the mission statement a world class education for anyone anywhere. It was maybe a little bit delusional at the time, but um, the the further we, we move along, the, the more it seems like like we, we we will be able to push push the envelope there. Great. Uh, let's go next to Stanford. Hi, uh, my name is Anjani. I'm a freshman at Stanford. And we've been studying gamification in class. And we, we looked at Jane McGonigal and how she's saying we should all basically live our lives as a game. 
how important has gamification been to the Khan Academy? And do you see basically the Khan Academy becoming an online classroom game? Yeah, well, well you know, uh, I, I agree with, with, with Jane on some level. I think, unfortunately, well, for better or for worse, a lot of life already is a game. It's just not that fun of a game. If you, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, it's funny sometimes when people in, in a traditional academic environment criticize things like badges or points. Uh, and I was like, well, what are what are report cards and transcripts and 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 grades? Uh, it's just they're, they're they're less fun. And, you know, it's, it's amazing how many people I know who, who really don't uh, who really view their bank accounts as more of a score than as some type of thing to support their family. Um, but with that said, I, I think it's it's a huge part of learning uh, is, is to it, it's, it's an instinctual part of learning for us to have things like game mechanics. And I think the, the more that we can do it in healthy ways and there are intrinsic and extrinsic ones, you know, intrinsic ones are to, to solve the game. You actually have to know the information. Extrinsic one is, hey, you know this. Now here's a badge. Here's something. Now you can customize your 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 experience in some way. And uh, so, yeah, I, we, we think it's a huge, it's a huge uh, potential, and, and we think we're just uh, in the very top of the first innings in, in exploring what, what, what becomes of that. Okay, thanks. Uh, let, let's see. Uh, MIT, are, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Yep. We are here. We're really excited that you're our commencement speaker. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> 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 so, hi, um, I'm Jane Emily, and my question is, what do you think the future of education is with the increase of using technology as an aid? Specifically, how do you think it will impact human-to-human -human education and the need for humans as resources of knowledge? And how does the Khan Academy videos interact with it within the classroom? Yeah, well, I'll take a stab at that, and I'd also love to hear what uh, what, what Peter and Sebastian have, because obviously they're they're doing some some amazing things there. I, if I and let me like clarify, so so you you want to know how how this whole thing is going to affect humans or, or the role of humans in organizations? If if I heard it correctly, yeah, yeah, the role. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So 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 uh, uh, at least in in our point of view, it 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 it, it frees up humans to to focus on things that. That are more human. Uh, you know, I, I mentioned in the introduction that we we want we want Khan Academy to be a tool to make classrooms more more interactive. You know, a lot of people when they hear about technology, they say, "Oh, this is going to be you know like the Vulcans or the Borg, and kids are just going to have problems all day, and they're not going to talk to each other." But the reality is, is that that's actually what our non-technology enabled classrooms look like right now. I you know I've sat in lecture halls, three hundred people. I go a semester. And I didn't know 99% of the people in the room. That's actually a dehumanizing experience right now, that you never get a chance to interact with these humans that you're actually in the same room with. And so I, I, I imagine a, a reality, and it's actually happening, and it's some of what we're talking about here are examples of that, uh, where uh, there are no longer these passive 300-person lecture halls or at the high school level, these passive 30% 30 lectures. I imagine a world where uh, most learners of all ages learning at their own pace, at their own time. They're getting real data. They're getting real feedback. And when they go into an environment where there are human beings, they get to be real human beings. They get to interact with each other. They get to tutor each other. Uh, the, the, the professor, rather than just broadcasting a lecture, will be able to walk around, form bonds with students. Um, and, and so it, 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 the way we view it, it actually takes up takes all the humans up up kind of the humanity chain. It, 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 and it really makes a, a teacher, if, if you have access to one, uh, that much more valuable. I'd, I'd love to hear what, what Sebastian and, and Peter think about that. Yeah, I mean, um, when I when I got my higher education in Germany, I have to admit it wasn't particularly good. In my own field of AI, uh, my professor had written a thesis 20 years earlier, and he was teaching classes only on his thesis. And the reason why he was at my university is because he couldn't get a job at MIT or Berkeley. Um, <laughs> had I just followed his advice, I would never have gone anywhere in my life. And I read a lot of books at the time and tried to get into international seminars. It was really hard. Um, I think what this new medium gives us is an ability to actually spread high quality education much further and really help. I feel in today's education, we like in the time when theater play was the only medium out there and every professor becomes their own actor. And if your actor is a bad actor, then tough luck, it's just your, your bad situation. Uh, and now we're moving into the era of film, we're inventing cinematography uh, for teaching, which means we can take high quality work like Simon's work and, and really distribute it and, and it helps people really better understand, and as Saab puts it, it, it frees up teacher's time. Not everyone has to be a complete entertainer anymore. We can focus on what we're really good at, which is one-on-one -on -one contact, talking to people, and building social relationships, and tutoring students. Yeah, and I think we want to try to use all the tools that we have in the best way. And uh, you know, I think too much of education had been focused on these uh, thousand-year-old technologies of uh, books and lecturers standing at the front of the class. Uh, 
and that's part of it, but there is so much more. And uh, these interactive technologies are, are some of it, and I think we're discovering how they fit together and what the best uh, way to do that is. Uh, I think we'll talk about some of that later, some of the questions we've seen online. People really want to know more about how we're trying to understand that, and I think we're just getting started figuring out uh, what tools work and what combination of tools work. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's go to uh, Columbia University. Columbia, are you there? Yeah. Um, so I was just wondering um, about what uh, on does well. Maybe thought about some of the utilities like Show Me that are trying to kind of create a platform for other people to um, to have their own um, tutorials on an iPad, for instance, and ecosystem like a more collective crowdsourced approach and is that a successful um, thing like in terms of quality of, of learning and, and so your audio is breaking up can you maybe come closer to the microphone I, I think I comprehend yeah. 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 percent of that so that might <laughs> yeah. okay sorry about that um, so I'm just wondering about your thoughts on um, platforms like show me um, which are trying to put uh, making these videos into the hands of like anyone who has an iPad so um, very easily just publish um, all through this platform. And they're trying to create kind of an ecosystem for crowdsourcing tutorial videos. And is, do you think that's a, a good thing? Um, would it dilute potentially the quality of these videos? Like, where do you? So, so, so the, the first part of that, I think it's an amazing thing. I mean, I think the, the, if there's, I mean, if that's one of the side effects of the Khan Academy, that, that by itself is a, is a really powerful one. If other people say, wait, you know, you don't need fancy lighting, fancy production. You literally just need your voice and some access to some pen type tablet tool. And, and that and my understanding of the show me app, I played around with it a few weeks ago is that, and, and what I hope is not to show me, but other uh, tools emerge on tablet devices and whatever else. So that, and even for myself, so that, you know, I don't need, so I don't need, you know, this thing right here, uh, I, I could just, you know, when I'm in a hotel room, I can just take out a tablet out of my pocket and start making a Khan Academy video. And so when those tools are available, I imagine a world where everyone starts using those uh, to explain a lot of things. And I, and I hope that it is used very broadly. Even in our own organization, we're now saying, well, you know, we talk so much about there shouldn't be lectures. Uh, well, why should, when we have a meeting, why should a manager sit at the front of the room and tell everyone about an update. That should be done on video so that other people can use it at a later time and that we could use the the, the, the meetings for actual interaction. And so uh, to answer your question, yeah, I, I think it's a great thing uh, for, for as many people as possible to, to create this content. Even on content that's already created, I think it's a powerful learning experience when the students themselves are able to explain a concept in their, in their own style or their own way. Yeah, I think what, one of the interesting things right now is that so few of us are teachers and so many of us should be teachers yeah. and have an aspiration to be teachers. And right now it's hard to become a teacher. You have to apply for a job, get a PhD, get tenure at Stanford. It's really hard to do. But if everybody can become a teacher, that would be awesome. Because every one of us, I think, is, has a story to tell and has something to do in, the, in that space and wants to, mm -hmm. to give on to others. Yeah. And, then, and, and answering the second part, which I think you, you, you touched on, was the notion of quality. And this is something that we're, we're struggling with. Right now, Khan Academy is heavily curated. Uh, we are thinking about creating ways for other people to generate content and use the platform, but it is an open question of, uh, uh, for, for the core experience, there is something about having a consistent experience, building trust in whoever's teaching you. And, and so we're, we're going to experiment with, with some balance between a, a crowdsourced and, and heavily curated. Maybe it's heavily curated crowdsourced content. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's move on to uh, University of Connecticut. Are you there, Connecticut? Yukon, please. Unmute. They actually accidentally lost co connection and wouldn't be able to get back on. OK. okay. Uh, how about uh, uh, NYU? Or are you there? Yeah, Mr. Khan. I just want to say thank you for your videos. The question I have to ask you is that I've been reading articles, and some of them have discussed schools that are flipping the curriculum in the sense that students are watching lectures at home, and they're doing homework in the classroom as a collective. Can you comment on the feasibility of that to spread that throughout all schools in the United States? Because my worst nightmare is that if you let these kids watch all these lectures on their own time, that they're not particularly motivated enough to actually watch these lectures. And then if they skip one, then they'll be increasingly more, to, more behind. So can you comment on that? 
Yeah, and, and, and no, that is something out there, and, and, and it's uh, and we've become somewhat associated with it, although that's not exactly what we're, we're fully advocating. We actually do think there is something to what you just described, the lectures at home. Uh, what we're more advocating is students learning at their own pace, wherever they are, and then using the classroom for, for interactivity. But, but to answer that, that, that flip the classroom, you, you know, the, the notion actually isn't that novel. It's, it's really analogous to a, a, a teacher in a seminar saying, hey, you know, read these 30 pages tonight and we're going to have a conversation about it tomorrow or a lot of business schools they have students look at cases and then they, they have a very rich conversation when they when they come to the classroom yeah. so, so that's really what that's about but but to address that that fear and it's a legitimate one well look you know, right now a lot of students are disengaged and you tell them to do homework and some just don't do it or some try to do it and they're not able to do it and then uh, they, they just they just kind of fall off the wagon uh, what what makes anyone think that they're gonna watch uh, lectures on their own and the reality is is well, there, there's, there's kind of a idealistic and there's a cynical answer to that. The, the idealistic answer is the reason why a lot of people don't do homework is because they can't or they've gotten discouraged and or, or the, 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 the content is just not at their level at that moment and so they, they can't do anything and they just give up. And then they go to class and get another passive lecture and then they do more home or they try to do more homework that they can't do. And then no one knows that everyone's struggling until the exam where they might get, they, maybe they fail the exam, but then the whole class has to move on to the next concept. And so in a reality where that student has access to a library of videos, not just the ones where the class is, but all of the ones that they can answer all of their questions for more formative stuff, they actually have a point of engagement. They can actually get up to speed. Um, and, and then they will want to participate. And, and, and the more cynical answer is, well, let's just say a reality that no matter what you tell a student to do at home, they're not going to do it at home, whether it's homework, problem sets, or, or it's video. Um, I've always felt that the most valuable part of, of an academic experience is actually the problem solving, less the actual uh, lecture or videos or, or anything like that. And so in a reality of, of a flip, uh, and, and, and the problem with the flip is it still implies kind of a synchronous learning model where everyone is learning at the same pace and being pushed along regardless of, of, of how well they know the subject. But at least in that flip, when you go to class, you're, you're, you're able to problem solve and you actually have resources at your disposal that could actually help you. You have your, your teachers, you have your peers. So I would actually think a student's actually going to get something out of the ability to interact in class time, even if they do nothing at home, versus not doing any homework and then just sitting passively and, and pretending to, to, to listen to a lecture. Yeah, from my perspective, I have to say, I, I think the entire concept of a lecture is just, just dull and boring. And I've, I've given way too many lectures in my life. And, and, and my students have this wonderful skill of looking interested and smiling at me. And when I ask them a question, there's at least one student who can respond. And then I'm happy because it completely empowers me to look really great as a lecturer. But it doesn't empower my students. So what we've tried to, to do in, in our class is to turn this around in a, in a very different way, where the entire class is driven by questions and by student participation. So if you, if you take our class, th there won't be any five minutes where we lecture at you before we're asking you a really hard question. And then if you get the question wrong, you, you learn it's wrong. And then eventually we tell you what the answer is. And I always think, I mean, if, if you get in the mode where the question comes first and, and you can safely answer the question without getting a negative grade and then do it multiple times, then, then the willingness for students and motivation to look at the answer is much, much higher. Uh, I feel in general that, that our lectures in college and in my, my school experience, they were just not motivated. Like someone comes in and says, oh, here's what integration is, okay? So why on earth do I care about integration? Like what problem do I have that, that, that relates to this material? I'm just sitting there thinking, okay, well, I don't care. And then I don't care and I get my C or what have you. Um, but if we, if we can turn this more into a medium that interacts with you, like the, where you, you're being challenged to do something and you're being rewarded if you master the challenge, there is a time in everyone's life where integration makes perfect sense. There will be a moment in your life, if I phrase it correctly, where you care about integration more than anything else. So, get, so poking out that moment, I think, is it's the, the key in, in turning this experiment around. I think for us, uh, the, the key that we're trying to figure out is how to combine a uh, personal experience with a group experience. So we, re we really want to enable uh, mastery on the part of an individual to say, you should keep interacting with the material until you've really gotten it, and that's going to be at your own pace. But at the same time, we find it's really motivating to have a group that's working together. And that's the advantage of, of having a class that's run synchronously, is everybody's there. You can go into the discussion forums. You can get help from your peers. And so we want to keep uh, some <laughs> group together so they can help each other while allowing people to work at their own pace. And getting that right, I think, is the trickiest part. OK. Uh, I think we've gone through all the uh, universities. Yeah, Boston College didn't, didn't no. show up. Yeah. Who else is missing? So, Columbia? So, yeah, so, they, so I don't think they're with us right now. Um, 
So why don't we, uh, uh, so thank you all schools for being there. It was, it was great to get a chance to uh, hear from you. Why don't you guys uh, sign out now and then luck of the draw, uh, whoever's next uh, can, can pop in and we'll take questions from them. And while that's happening, uh, let's go to some of the questions uh, from the Google moderator. Let's see, uh, the first one was from uh, Quantum Fred in Charlotte, North Carolina. Structured online courses have huge potential to bring down the production cost of education. Uh, how do we convince universities and employers to recognize these? And what role will physical universities play in the future? Sal, that's a question for you. <laughs> All right. Um, well, you know, I guess there's a, the, the first part implies that, you know, we, we need to convince the universities. And I think there, there's something to be said there. Uh, but I think, I think to, to, to a large degree, they're, they're, they're almost, they're, their hand is going to be forced in a few years. I mean, you, you see things like tuition going up 5% more than the rate of inflation every year. Uh, and it's really because universities do have this kind of, I don't know what you want to call it, an oligopoly on, on this credential that told all students that, look, you need thing if you want to have a, you know, a, a satisfying, happy, productive life, or, or at least, a, you know, be able to have a house and food on the table. And so because of that, they're able to, to raise this tuition. And, and the problem is, is it's not just the tuition, is that the, the tuition's there and, and uh, more and more students are, are, are being told they need to get these college degrees. And then they, they leave with the college degrees and these loans. And the degree is not the signal to employers that this person is employable that, that it once was. That all, you know, we, we read stories every day about young people who are, who've graduated, um, not maybe from some of the schools that we have here, but who, who've graduated uh, often with good GPAs and, and, and they, they, can't find, they can't find jobs. Not that that's all that school is about. And so I, I do see a reality uh, where you, you have uh, the, 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 the learning part of education and the credentialing part of education eventually does get decoupled. So you have well-defined rigorous assessments, maybe more rigorous than any of the exams given at universities. Maybe they're oral exams, maybe they're practical exams that show, you know what, you really are an amazing coder, or you really do understand finance really well, or you really do have good communication skills, and, 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 and not, you know, not at, at, you know, based on what one regional university says or one university, based on a national standard or an international standard, so that when Google's looking for people, they get more information than just a 3.5 GPA from such and such university in computer science. They'll say, wow, by this really rigorous international standard, I know that this person is one in 500 or one in 1,000. We're definitely going to interview that person. And I think as soon as you have that decoupling process, then students can prepare any way that they see fit. They can go to a university. They can go to a community college. They can learn on Khan Academy. They could get an internship or a series of internships and just learn on the job, or they could learn off of the web or whatever else they do. And as soon as something like that happens, and these decoupled credentials actually have more, more currency uh, as a signaling mechanism to employers, I think then all of a sudden universities will will have to look really hard at their at their at, at what they're you know what what they're charging for. Frankly, um, I, I think I think the future of the physical university I think is going to be a mixed bag. I think places, frankly, a lot of the universities that we've just been speaking to, I, they're they're going to be around. I mean, one obviously they're amazing research institutions, but they're also very very valuable life experiences. I would never uh, trade away. Uh, my, my experience in, in college uh, for anything. And, 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 and it was valuable above and beyond just the ability to get a job or, or to learn a few things. Um, so I think you'll, you'll have some places that, that will have that, um, that, that will do very well there. But I think all universities are going to have to uh, think about becoming a little bit more uh, conscientious of, 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 I guess, the, their, their cost structures. Yeah, right? I would say you don't have to, to convince the universities, as, as Salah put it, you have to convince the students and the employers, yeah. and the teachers. And most of all, the students, I think, and the employers, and then the universities will be convinced by themselves. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is, um, I mean, people often ask me, how does it relate to college experience? And this is a substitute. And of course, it's not. Uh, the vast majority of our students are students who can't go to campuses, that are people in midlife that have a mortgage to pay and want to get uh, further from the education, people in the developing world where there's just no good opportunity. Which the cost structure doesn't fit. So I think we are reaching, we've reached some, such a great number of totally amazing students and found amazing students and enabled amazing students. I think that's a big part of this. We can all of a sudden democratize education into the entire world, which is really, really amazing. Okay. Uh, Sebastian, you were looking at some of the questions. Did you want to pick one out? <laughs> Let me read one. Okay, how about from Spain? Is this being done or planned to be done on the data, just with Khan Academy and Stanford online classes? 
I think, Salman, you're the furthest away, uh, sorry, uh, ahead of all of us in terms of research on data. Yeah, you know, and there's there's some uh, fairly detailed blog posts that, that we've, we've been putting up on what's been happening. But we, um, you know, we, we collect so much data on every interaction that's happening. And, and you know, the data is super powerful in a bunch of ways. Uh, one, you can start to get information not too different than what Netflix does to understand what's likely to engage someone. And we're, we're just completely scratching the surface now, right, on, on that metric. Uh, we can also use data, you know, when you, when you think about something like A-B testing, having a small sample of, of your population experience a slightly different thing and then, and then seeing how it performs relative to some outcome, uh, that's super valuable for someone like Amazon.com to make you buy a book or Google to figure out, uh, your, you know, the, the, the search results or to figure out what ads are really uh, compelling to you. But the real killer app there is education. And so we are starting to use data uh, to, one, uh, tweak the content, tweak the experience, tweak some of the motivating factors. We're starting to use it to define what proficiency really is. How can we start to be predictive of how well someone is, is really understanding this content and then act on that so that we can so that we can introduce them or have them review concepts at the right time. So, uh, you know, we, we think we're the very top of the first inning here, but I, I think it's going to play a huge, huge role. Yeah, and uh, I would echo that. Uh, you know, we've been so busy producing our course, we haven't had much time yet to uh, to look at the data, but uh, we're excited uh, by that possibility. And we got a couple of people who are just starting to, to take a look. And there's just so much more. And, and uh, this was really one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, do this in the first place, is I had just finished up doing a revision of my uh, paper textbook. And I just thought about how impoverished the feedback was that, you know, I'd be trying to explain a topic and I'd say, oh, well, here's two possible ways to explain it. I wonder which one of those is better. And I had to make that call just on my own. Uh, but if I had the opportunity to, instead of stamping this book onto dead trees, of having it be live, uh, then I could get feedback on the two explanations and say, oh, people yeah. like this explanation better. Or maybe people with this type of background in mathematics like one explanation and people with a different background like a different explanation. Yeah. We haven't looked that much at the data yet because we're scrambling to, to finish our class, but one of the most interesting early findings was we compared the uh, top students that did 100% uh, score and, and homework assignments online with the ones that are in Stanford classroom. And to our shocking surprise, the ratio of people performing top notch was twice as high online as it was at Stanford. Now, they so there are many reasons. Is that twice the number of students? No, no, no twice, twice the, the ratio. The percentage. Twice the ratio, wow. Well, the number of students was like uh, 500 times as large. Yeah. Wow, okay. So we had like four top performing Stanford students. We had 1,250 top performing online students. So for the, for the best Stanford students out of 200, we, had, we found four really great ones, uh, according to, to that simple statistic. Um, we found 1,250 students in the world that, that would measure really well, and I would admit blindly into Stanford based on, on that performance alone. It's quite amazing. So there's at least 100 Stanfords out there that we don't even see and, and don't even get involved in the U.S. education system at this point. So I think we're going to use data like this, and, and the fact that we, we have this amazing scale between uh, Khan Academy and the class that we've been running really opens entirely new opportunities to, to leverage data to assess people, to assist people in our educational content. Okay, let's go to a, a live question. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, Peng Liu, are, are you there? Do you have a question? Um, not currently. <laughs> not now, okay. Uh, let's see, how about uh, Mark Fobert? I have a question. All right, why don't you go ahead and jump in. This is uh, Harold Carey. I work with the Navajo, uh, the Navajo tribe of Indians and we do online training and this is a wonderful thing for them. I was just wondering what your thoughts you had to do. We do. We have a program called Classroom to the Hogan, and I broadcast here from my basement to all the all the all the classrooms and stuff over the Navajo River Reservation, and they're like three and four miles apart. Some of these places. And so, what were your ideas of? I think this is a great way to uh, do remote remote education to rural people. That's a wonderful thing you're doing this, and, and it's great to hear that, that you're doing this because I bet there's lives you change with what you're doing uh, in, in this broadcast. And it looks like, from the little you said, that the motivation is exactly the same that brings us together doing the same and spending our nights and, <laughs> and weekends <laughs> and not all the same thing. Yeah, no, and, and I think you're, you're, you're spot on. This is, a, this is a big deal, as valuable as it is for 
kids in you know suburban America um, imagine on the, the students on your reservation not just not just kids I mean what, what's really powerful about this is there's no longer a stigma of well you know I'm 20 years old I still don't know pre-algebra well do I have to go sit in a classroom of a bunch of 12 year olds or do I have to go take a remedial math class now I have the privacy and and I don't have to feel embarrassed about what I I do and don't know. I mean I, I I'll admit personally I enjoy online learning a lot more because I'm able to ask questions that I'm afraid to ask some of, some of my friends because they'll judge me wrong. And That's and right. and when you think about the delivery costs and how quickly uh, technology is getting cheaper and the bandwidth, uh, it, it, you know on your reservations and you were seeing this even in the developing world. We actually talked to uh, to the governor of a state of of Mexico recently, and it looks like they're going to be providing broadband to all of their students. And, and I mean, when you think about the implications of every student in the state of Mexico having access to a, apparently a laptop and broadband and having access yeah. to these type of resources, it's, it's actually mind blowing. Thank you. Another live question, by chance? Let's see. Yeah. No. No. Somebody want to jump in with a question? Kenneth Duane? Okay, we can read another one. Okay, uh, here's a question number four by Yuma Gopi, whoever that is. Hi. Uh, what have you learned so far with your approach of online teaching? That's a long answer. Maybe yeah. Peter, you should start <laughs> and then sell. I guess to, uh, to me, the biggest thing uh, was to uh, try to simulate uh, more interaction uh, in that, uh, you know, so we, we know we have some expertise that, that we thought we would be able to impart. Uh, but it's not just having the knowledge, it's having the motivation and teaching people wanting to work. Because you all have uh, in incredible powers uh, to do great things, uh, but we have to find a way to, uh, to unlock that. And we know, I mean, uh, you know, you heard Khan started out as a one-on-one -on -one tutor, and we believe that that's the most powerful way to uh, teach. Uh, studies have seemed to have shown that. And so we wanted to get something that was as close as we could to one-on-one, -on -one uh, while still being one to 100,000. And it seems paradoxical, uh, but we've been sort of fumbling our way towards trying to understand that. And so one of the things we did was make the interval shorter between the time when we say something and the time when we ask something. And, uh, and then it's been a whole learning experience to try to figure out, well, what types of questions can you ask? We don't want to just ask a simple rote question where you uh, fill in the blank for something that you already know. Uh, but on the other hand, we can't have you write an essay and have that essay be fairly graded. So we had to come up with ways of asking questions that are challenging and, and take it to the next step, uh, but still enable you to fit that answer into a, a small input box. Uh, so, so I think that's, that's part of where we are. And, and we just feel like we're just getting started understanding uh, what works and what doesn't work. So Sal, have you learned anything? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, many things. I, I think that, you know, the, the really, uh, uh, non-obvious thing uh, but that we get re reminded of every day is and I think you know there's even a question along this line is that we all are got indoctrinated frankly in a system or we're part of a system where because we've seen how much people struggle with concepts and people get frustrated and and behavioral problems and all the things that we've all experienced in the classrooms that we've been in there, there's kind of a pervasive assumption in, in the current academic system that kids don't want to learn, that they're not motivated, that only maybe 5 or 10 or 15 percent of kids are motivated. What, what we've seen is that when you give the tools for someone to engage at a level that they're ready for, but then go from that level to anywhere that they want, that it's not 5 or 10 percent of the population that's actually motivated and wants to learn. I suspect it's 95 or maybe 100 percent of the population, and it's really just about uh, 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 catering to, to their exact needs. Over and over and over again, we're getting letters. We got like five yesterday from students who are I was I dropped out of high school. I, I I became a drug addict, and I you know I was kind of left for a goner. And now I, I you know these online tools have given me the opportunity to learn at my own pace, develop myself. And you know one one letter from yesterday, they're now at the the one of the best universities in Australia. And and you see this narrative over and over and over again. There's this huge gap between people's potentials and where they end up. And online tools, frankly, I think go a long way. And, and, and the other really powerful thing, and this is something that Sebastian has touched on, is that our current system is kind of like a one-shot high-stakes system. If you just happen to be a really good you know, 13-year-old or 18-year-old, and right at those times in, in your development in your life, you're just really into the game, things tend to work out well for you. 
But if you happen to be a little bit rebellious when you're 18 or you have something happen in your family or something weird happens and you're not fully engaged, uh, you kind of fall off the wagon. And what online learning does is because you're not dependent on these, you know, these age-based groupings and all of that, that, hey, you're 30, you've made some mistakes in your life, but you want to re-engage. And, and I think they're seeing that with the AI class. We're seeing that at Khan Academy. These 30-year-olds re-engage and then do unbelievably amazing things. Right. Right. We're seeing 70-year-olds, uh, not just 30-year-olds. Yeah. Yeah. And no, on that, you know, I, I got a letter from a – this was one of the most powerful letters I got. This was in 2007. A, a woman who had terminal breast cancer three months left to live, and she said she was going to spend the last three months of her life learning calculus, because that was just one of those things. Yeah. And, and when you see things like that, you realize that it's actually not 5%. It's, it's an innate human need to want to learn, and it's actually sad how, how many people have that stripped from them. I agree. It's an interesting uh, insight that I, that I had that really changed me is I've been indoctrinated as a teacher to, to, to put emphasis on testing and making sure my grades are all accurate. And I have had no scruple to grade people out, to be honest. I mean, they even set up in the beginning is you could take a test, each, each test once, and if you didn't get it, well, you got to see. And as we moved on, I realized this was an entirely wrong attitude to teaching. I'm saying this because I think I'm not the only teacher out there doing this. My, my attitude really changed to, you know, if everybody gets an A+, plus, then, then, then I'm great. And, and, and A+, plus means that people get it. And if they need like 5, 10, 20 attempts to get it, so what? It's, it's much better than taking an attitude to say, my job is to find the bad people and give them Cs. Mm -hmm. And it really affected our class. We, we restructured as we moved on uh, into a class where people can have made trials now. Um, and, and we see the retention of people staying with us actually going up, not down at this point, which is quite amazing. Uh, do, do we have a live question? Somebody want to jump in? Um, so I was just wondering about, um, so if you have any plans for hosting perhaps a more advanced AI class that goes more into the mathematical theoretical basis of the techniques that you taught this semester because like I it's kind of the same with the ML class that I'm taking right now it's taught how to apply it but then if I wanted to develop further upon the techniques that were taught like where do I start from there like right now I'm uh, watching the linear algebra lectures on Khan Academy for example and they're amazing, by the way, Sam, and thanks. Um, so, yeah, basically plans on going deeper into the theoretical aspects of what was taught. Uh, we'd love to. Uh, we'd love to teach more classes. We're kind of even brainstorming what the next step is in general in terms of what content to offer. We also have to go on vacation because it's been very straining <laughs> in our time. <laughs> we do a lot of mid post-midnight work. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the hope is the, the way that the AI class at Stanford is like the introductory class. It hooks you on AI. And then each of these little uh, units um, have deepening cl classes on their own, which you can go like as an entire computer vision class, as an entire probabilistic inference class that my colleague Daphne Koller teaches. Uh, and those are going online right now at Stanford, or they will be going online in the future. Right. Right. So uh, Daphne's teaching that class on, on graphical models, and uh, there's a natural language class that, that's going right. to be happening. And uh, so, there, so there's some of those options there. We'll, we'll probably do more. Uh, I th we thought that uh, we want to do the introductory class first, because uh, we saw a, a bigger calling for that. And then also, we w before doing something more advanced, we wanted to get a little bit more of the technology in place to uh, be able to do programming assignments and things like that in, uh, in a much smoother way th than what we have available now. So once we get that in place, then uh, we can do more. Okay, thanks. Although, and just one last comment, though. I love the way it's taught, like how the quizzes are given before the concepts are fully introduced, because it really makes you think. And I don't know about other people, but I personally find that the self-learning definitely sticks deeper than when it's just spoon-fed to you. Thanks. Right. Thank you. That's a great compliment. I right. really appreciate that. So that, that's one thing we've been trying to do is, you know, I talked about trying to get away from this limitation of multiple choice or fill-in-the-blank questions. So we try to ask uh, challenging, open-ended questions uh, that make you think about it before we've told you everything. And uh, we're glad that you appreciate that. A uh, question uh, from Z. Marill. Maybe, Sal, you should take the first dip here. It's a controversial question. Do you expect backlash from other educational institutions as time goes on? Outside university administration uh, might be cagey about the idea of Stanford and Khan Academy delivering high quality education for free. Why should students pay in the United States $30,000 a year anymore? Yeah, well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see uh, the 
you know, frankly, everyone at the universities I've, I've, at every university I've talked to have been very supportive. Um, I, I don't think we'll, we'll see backlash un, until, um, I mean, you know, the reality, and this is actually a very phenomenal, it's an interesting economic phenomenon where uh, if you ask a university administrator what, you know, what they're charging 30, 40, $50,000 a year for, they'll say, oh, it's a, you know, it's this learning experience, you know, look at our campus, look at the salaries of the professors and the research labs. But if you ask the parents or the students why they're going into debt and paying this 30 or, you know, second mortgages or whatever else to pay the tuition, they say, we're, we're paying it for a credential, a credential that'll allow us to, to, you know, be employable or whatever else. And so you have a huge amount of money. I mean, as you measure a proportion of someone's life in earnings, it's a huge proportion of that. It, it's a, it's a major transaction that's going on where the person who's selling it thinks that they're selling something very different than the person who's buying it. And so mm -hmm. I, I think, I think when, um, when you decouple the credential from the learning, and I think it's a matter of time because credentialing is actually, even if you do far more rigorous credentials than what you do right now, in a, you know, a far more rigorous assessments than what's now done in the university, uh, that, that's a far cheaper process than, 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 than a lot of what, you know, the $40,000 points to. Not that I don't think that there are valuable things. You know, I, I met my wife on campus and that, that, that was worth at least $40,000. And so uh, <laughs> I, 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 I think, I think that's when it's going to cause them pause. I don't think it's going to be backlash. Uh, I think it's more going to help them adapt to uh, a kind, kind of kind of the, the realities of of, uh, of, of reality. <laughs> and I say uh, we, we've seen nothing but support as well. So uh, Sebastian and I have, have had a chance to interact with uh, President Hennessy at Stanford, and he's uh, definitely behind this all the way. Yeah. Uh, question from Seattle by Anne Lux. Free high quality video lectures have been around for a while now. But Khan Academy and the iClass have both received a disproportionate amount of attention. What have you done differently that seems to bring more students in and keep them more engaged? Um, Y'all want to start? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Either so way. Our own model, you should yeah. start. What, uh, what well, you, so, you know, I, it's an open question. We don't know. Um, and, and I'd probably, you know, well, well we, 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 don't, we don't know the answer. Um, I mean, we have, we, we, I have theories. Um, I, I think. A lot of it might have to do with uh, style. Uh, uh, people, uh, you know, I, I don't take myself too seriously, as is pretty obvious. And I think maybe, you know, I, I feel like people's older brothers or their cousins, like which is how really this started. I, in fact, I often think that one of the secret sauces of Khan Academy that this was for my cousins, and it had a tone for my cousins. And I didn't, you know, if 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 on two thousand five. Uh, Bill Gates or Google came up to me and said, Sal, here is $2 million. Go create a virtual school. I said, oh, I have $2 million. Bill Gates is watching. Google is watching. Let me go hire some video producers. Let me get some compu fancy computer graphics. And I probably would have produced content that's not too different than what McGraw-Hill publishes, where you have a really beautiful computer graphic of, you know, the mitochondria, and then you hear a voiceover from, you know, the same person who, who, who does your uh, GPS systems. You know, the next step in mitochondria is when the, you know, the chloroplast. And, but, and, and it wow, looks very well. Oh, yeah, you like that. Yeah, maybe I should work for Tom Tom. Or whatever. But, 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 the, but, but the reality is that that looks very professional. A lot of people associate that with a good material, but a human being doesn't connect with that type of material because that's not how human beings actually interact. And so I think they like the fact that Khan Academy feels like their older brother or their cousin uh, sitting down with them at the kitchen table uh, with, you know, a colorful pen and a blackboard. And, and just working things through and thinking in real time and not being scripted about things and, 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 and actually, you know, being open to making, making mistakes every now and then and then later correcting them and things like that. So I think that's a large part of the initial popularity. And if you, on top of that, I think the feeling, because there was such a breadth of, of concepts there that you could start everywhere in very incremental ways, you could, you could get wherever you wanted. And I think probably the last piece is most education material is done very top down. Uh, whether it's at the state uh, office of education or it's at a, at a publishing company, they say, okay, we need to create an algebra textbook. And they say, okay, what are the state standards for algebra? Okay, there are these 50 things. Okay, let's get some PhDs together to figure out the best way to phrase those questions. And then let's raise some questions. And then the last thing they actually think about is, is a student actually going to find this compelling? Um, or is this something that actually makes sense to a human brain? And, and I think one of the kind of uh, neat things about Khan Academy is because it, at least initially it came from one person kind of holistically thinking about math, there are no artificial separations between yeah. the different concepts and you can cross reference and you really start to feel like, wow, this guy has a holistic understanding of math. I, I can have one too. Yeah. For, for me, I think one of the important things was to say, we wanted to put together a course that was for you, that was uh, for the, the listener and was happening now. 
Whereas what we've seen before at MIT OpenCourseWare, at iTunes University, it was like, well, here's a recording of a dead class that happened with somebody else at some time in the past, and I missed it. Uh, but now I'm going to get a chance to see yeah. the, uh, the resurrection of it. Uh, I generally think, yeah, I think that, that, that most classes that I've experienced uh, empower the professor but not the student. Like, I, 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 endless examples of a professor giving me expressions and things I can't possibly understand. Like, German is very common. Like, a German professorial talk has to be so much math that, that you get the impression you're just dumb in comparison to the professor. Hmm. And I think what Sal has, has taught all of us, and we're trying to aspire to do the same thing, is just empower the students. Like, it's not us that matter. It's the student that, that gets a skill. If a student sends me an email and says, look, I'm amazed how much I've learned, how much I can, can do myself now, how much empowered I feel, that's when we succeed. So I try to cut out all the bullshit that comes with like giving classes normally at Stanford. We have these equations and expressions that look really smart and really focus on the essential materials at a level that people could get them and, and, and practice them. And, and that's been at least my recipe so far. I don't know whether that's working. I hope it is. Okay. Anyhow. Uh, we out of time? Or? I guess we're, yeah, we're out of time. So uh, thank you all for participating. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, uh, all the students who were, who were able to uh, stop by. And uh, we hope we can do this again sometime. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>